We were a major winemaker in Australia. Up until probably the 1920s, it was quite significant. Certainly in the 1890s is probably when it hit its peak. There was nothing to compare to Murray Valley at, at that time. Easily the biggest winery in Australia, not just in this area, in Australia. Frere was recognised worldwide for his efforts. Can you imagine trying to send wine from Australia to London to get it? The ship doesn't sink, you know, you've got to get it to the port on time, mustn't go off. And they loved it in London. The variety of, of people who came in the early days to forge a life here, oh, it's just a richness. We go back to 1851, three Germans walked into Aubrey looking for the Murray River, which they called the Rhine of Australia. And their names were Fraunfelder, Schubach and Rau, and they were the four bears of many Germans who came here. These were the Catholic Germans who came to Aubrey and established the wine industry, which grew to be the biggest wine industry in Australia by far, making South Australia look like a hobby farm. So James Fallon was uh, an Irishman. He came out to Australia in 1841 under a uh, bounty immigrant scheme and he ended up in Albury in, uh, supposedly in 1854. Opened a general store and that's where he made his money. I think he was a number of things, from obituaries and things that people wrote about him. A visionary, uh, a, a very good businessman, a self-made man in terms of how he became a, a, a winemaker when he knew nothing about wine making. He was reputed to be both at his business dealings and as the Member of Parliament, uh, uh, a man who uh, was extremely hardworking and, uh, you know, an honest, diligent, decent man. And it was Aubrey's first mayor. At that time, there was some incentives for people to get into winemaking. It was seen as something that was coming. Um, there was already vineyards in places like the Hunter Valley. He uh, was involved in the creation of the Murray Valley Vineyard. The company was formed. The amount of land they bought was 640 acres. It's an enormous amount of land. There's not a winery in the world, I don't think, just 600 acres. The maximum they ever planted was about 200. His uh, crowning achievement was, of course, the, the cellars that were um, a work of art, really, and were famous throughout, uh, certainly throughout Australia, not only in terms of their size and the volume of the wine that they could hold, which apparently was about 300,000 gallons, not litres, gallons. And probably the most famous of all of those things in the cellars were massive casks that he had specially made that took uh, about 2,000 gallons each, which was unheard of at the time. Anybody of any significance came to Albury, it was a must that you, that you visited Ballon Cellars, and everybody marvelled at them. You know, I, I would venture to say they were probably unique. All these beams, they were extraordinary. Oh, the press. We've got one of those hand presses over there with the Fallon press. He must have made them. Yeah, they he brought some out and then yeah. remade them. Cellars, but the vineyard itself was, was very famous throughout Australia. And again, you know, if you came to Albury, you would go and uh, look at the vineyard. The, the people marvelled at the um, at the view you could have, and you know, it's one of the things I used to love as a kid: the view you can get from up there as to how far you can see. Look, his legacy really is that he put the Albury wine industry and the Australian wine industry front and centre. I mean, he wasn't alone. I don't want to pretend that he was, but he was. By oh, gee, he was. Um, you know probably head and shoulders above almost anybody else in, in the country at the time. He pushed his wines into not just the English mark, but uh, into America, into Canada, into India, you know, places that you wouldn't even necessarily associate with people who would buy a lot of wine. 
He also went and visited the vineyards in several countries. The main place he went, obviously, was to France. He engaged uh, with uh, Leon Frere to come to Australia to manage the winery, specifically to make champagne, um, but certainly to manage the winery in general. I think it was a new life. I think Frere had lost his money in the Franco-Prussian War. I mean, you can't imagine what it would have been like for them to come to the other. It would have been like going to the moon, you know. Fallon had been trying to encourage people to come and grow wine in this area, so he must have found this winemaker in France and said, come out to Australia. It's much better out there. <laughs> and bring some olive trees with you as well. <laughs> yeah, and to convince his wife and bring a small child with them it have been quite a thing. And the small child then went on to become mayor of Albury. And there he is in his new Renault. And again, that whole thing about shipping a car out from France, you know, that would have come here on a ship and then been driven perhaps from Sydney or Melbourne. It's the last link back to those days, that direct link to the winemaking heritage. It's the oldest part of Thaguna. It was built by a French pioneer vigneron who came out with a vision to grow champagne, grow wine, and they ended up transporting it all over the world. And this was their home. This is where they lived, ate, slept, partied, told stories. I strongly believe that old buildings should be preserved and cared for. I'm passionate about that. I think that's, that's really important. I mean, they're precious. If they're gone, they're gone forever. And that's what's so sad about a lot of what has happened in this area. Things just get knocked down and replaced. And then there's nothing. One of the things I do is I map old gardens. This is St John's Road and the old driveway came up here. And these are the old cottages. We think the Freres first lived in that cottage before they built the house. The place had been gutted. Somebody had been through and pulled everything out. The council said, you've got to knock that down. And I delayed it by six months while I tried to work out what to do. And they said, you won't stop the demolition order. You can take us to court, but you won't stop it. It'll have to happen tried to save as much as I could. Then the demolition crew came in. They just pulled the whole lot down, shoved it into trucks and disappeared. I was devastated. And these books were found in a little tiny weatherboard lean-to on the ground, in the dirt, just left out there probably for, a, you know, a good 80 to 100 years. You know, they brought these out to read and read on the ship coming out perhaps. But the most exciting find was this manual here. It's a scientific document about the effect of oxygen and how it affects wine and the fermentation process, all in French. So it would have been Frere's manual, you know, it's his, probably his Bible, what he brought out to France. It would have been very precious for him. And then these wonderful illustrations showing the different colours the wine changes when it's exposed to air or bacteria. There they were, lying on the ground, full of slugs and snails. And I just think it's wonderful to have this. And then to know that he handled that, that chappy there, he built the house, it all comes together in a bit of a story. Down here are the workings of the vineyard, the cellar, which has gone, but the vats are still there and these concrete vats are there. These are the remnant vats from the winemaking days. Would have been a real hub, you know. So many people I've shown this, yeah, they're just amazed. Just... I had no idea this was here. There's still a few relics out there. There's actually still some of the old open fermenters beside the railway line that were James Fallon at, at Murray Valley Vineyards, which not many people have known what they are. The remains of the cellar at um, Edamoga Winery. When you go and look at it, you can sort of put yourself back in time. Because it was a very big winery too. What we call Tabletop Road now was actually the main highway to Sydney. And there was a lot of vineyards along there. Not so many wineries, but a lot of vineyards, and they would have supplied the bigger wineries like James Fallon or Greer or Edamoga. The other thing you should remember is before 1901, of course, New South Wales, before Federation, New South Wales was like a different country to Victoria. If we wanted to take any of our produce over the river, well, we had to pay duty on it.
was um, was like two different countries. People were forced to use the Murray River and hence we had the, uh, the Port of Albury created by James Fallon. He bought a paddle steamer called the Cumberuna and would take his wine down to Echuca, put it on the railway line, take it to Melbourne. He would convince the sailing ship captains to pump out their water ballast and he put large 2,000 and 3,000 gallon big casks in the ships and they'd use it as ballast and get his wine to England for a penny a gallon freight and hence the massive export market and the Rutherglen wineries followed suit. Fallon, who was the largest, and St Hilaire and Etta Moga were all exhibiting wines in the great exhibitions in London and in Vienna and winning awards. And they weren't for ports, they weren't for sherries, they were for red wines, Cabernets, Shiraz, they were for Riesling, um, and these wines were regarded. And when you read the reviews of those exhibitions, they were regarded extremely highly and equal to, if not better, than the wines of Europe at the time. When you go and see the wineries, uh, particularly in Rutherglen, like Chambers is an example, I think it's been in the famous for six generations, and you say, hmm, you know, how come they're still in business? And there's many wineries down there that have been in business for a long time. Why have they prevailed and, and Aubrey's didn't? There was obviously the phylloxera thing, but I don't think it was a major cause. It was, um, there was actually a, I believe there was a bounty given on pulling vines at one stage so that farmers would go into other industries, as into into cropping. Drought, uh, economics, um, fights between the states and those sorts of things. Aubrey was the victim of that. And then the run up to the First World War, the wine industry generally in Australia collapsed and didn't come back really until after the Second World War. We first planted vines in uh, 1998 with the view to having a, a small boutique winery. We use all of the old traditional methods bottling, doing everything here on site. During harvest, of course, we're all hand-picked, so we need a lot of labour. Most of our uh, traffic that we get is word of mouth and people that have been driving along the highway. In fact, at the cellar doors here at Splitters Creek, and it's such a beautiful spot. We do outdoor weddings. A lot of the um, wedding photography is done amongst the vines, amongst the old cottages, and they just love it. They just love it. Probably 1890s, the cottage. So my grandparents grew up here. Walking around you can still see the remnants of the old gardens, you know, a few of the old trees and the, the footings are actually rocks off the hill and that's where I grew up with my six brothers and sisters. The, the way to make it survive was to make it useful so that's the reason it became the cellar door. We uh, purchased this property about four years ago. We saw it as an amazing opportunity because the vines have been in for over 22 years which is also very surprising for people that are, are local in the Albury Wodonga region. They firstly didn't know that there was a winery out here um, and secondly didn't know the quality of the fruit and, and the wine that it could produce. You know, for us um, coming into uh, owning a, a winery the, the most we knew about it was drinking it effectively and we had but we had a real passion for, for wine and a passion for you know marketing and what, what things look like and both Karen and I knew what we liked to taste and we knew what we liked to look at. So we you know, appointed an amazing winemaker and that's how Posh Blanc was born. I guess we've, we've targeted a real niche market in that corporate gifting space as well and there's not many other wineries that have, have done that or focused on that. And it's a real niche in the market that, um, that we've found that we, uh, you know, we, we love being a part of that gifting market. You know, if you have a bit of presence on, on Instagram and Facebook and uh, you know, show some good photos from time to time, uh, it really helps with your brand and, and, and the acceptance of your brand. And I think those two mediums have sort of helped us connect with the world. But with the Salador experience, we wanted to create something uh, unlike anything else. And what we wanted to do is um, ensure that everyone um, got a true wider experience when they came out and, and weren't rushed through a tasting process or rushed out of the property or you know we're, we're just going from winery to winery it is completely different than going out you know in, in town and um, like everyone else would um, but uh, but here they can sit and enjoy the view. The more that I look into uh, the past it's extremely exciting and, and now we're a piece of that. People of Albury and uh, Wodonga and uh, Victoria in this area should be justifiably proud of what a wonderful history they have. Thank you.